Good morning. Good morning, church. We're so glad you're here. Can you all hear me? So good to see you this morning. We have gathered this morning because we've chosen to worship the one true living God, correct? Great. Will you stand, please, as we read God's word this morning? From Psalm 97, 10. O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sworn for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Amen. Ready? Our theme this morning is the church and we are the light of the world. Let's sing together this little light of mine, a great spiritual and a great gospel song. going to sing another song. It's in your songbooks. It's 439 if you want to follow along. Song for the Nations. May we be a shining light to the nations. them in the name of the Lord. God bless you.
As I look out at all of you folks greeting one another with your big smiles, you would make one great Crest toothpaste advertisement. My goodness. <laughs> it's awesome to, <laughs> awesome to see you smile and to greet one another. We have a few announcements we'd like to make this morning. First of all, uh, we have a connection card coffee with pastors today. Out in the patio, you'll see a little sign uh, one of us will be there with directions, and we want you, if you're new to us and you'd like to know more about TFB, what we believe, what we do, we pray that you'll just come and join with us for a few minutes. We'd love to just have an opportunity to share with you. Tomorrow, our big day, our Harvest Festival. Yes, let's give a hand for our Harvest Festival. <clears throat> Now, in clapping this morning, you all just agreed that you're going to come and help us. <laughs> I, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but we really do need your help. And so we're going to be gathering about 4.30, 5 o'clock at the latest. If you can't make it till after that, we understand. But if you can by 4.30, please come. We've got lots of setup to do, and we want to be able to get it all done before the folks come. So that's tomorrow. Also, if you, if you have candy and you haven't brought it, we pray that you still will do it. Carla, where are you? Carla's waving her hand. If you have any questions, whatever, Carla is our, is our contact person, and she will be happy to help you. And then on November the 6th, we start our big month of November, the Apologetic Sunday with J. Warner Wallace. It'll be a valuable time for, for you to be here. There'll be an opportunity for questions afterwards. And so November the 6th with Jay uh, Warner Wallace. And then on the 13th, we have a very special day for the life of TFB. Our dear brother Jeremy, he's already a pastor, but he's going to be ordained publicly in front of us as a church family. Say yes, give Jeremy. So that's going to be a special day for us, a very special day for Jeremy. So uh, please come and celebrate with us. And then last thing, shoe boxes are due November the 13th, so we have two more Sundays. We pray that you will also help us with that. It's a wonderful ministry to children throughout the world. Jeremy. Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, was I the only one who, like, I don't know, clapped during that song? <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's how I was raised. I mean, like, that, that song, you know, like, let it shine until Jesus. And then Pastor Jared and I connected, like, don't let Satan <laughs> it out. <laughs> right? Um, but hopefully y'all can clap with us. Yeah, right? I see the turning and stuff. But stand up with us because um, these songs are going to require some clapping, too. Um, so, yeah. Ooh, let's, let's do this. Let's uh, stay on beat, people. Let's do this. Okay. <clears throat> Come set your rule and reign. In our hearts again, come grease in us, we pray, unveil why we were made.
Can y'all bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Lord God, thank you, God, that you are our strength. You are the one that we rely on, or God, at least we're supposed to. And so, God, I pray that during this message, Lord, you may just convict us of all of the things that we've been learning about, that we are a gospel-shaped church, and that requires us to be living out the gospel. So, Lord, help us to be salt and light in this world for the cause of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Good to see everybody here. If you see me do something like this in the middle of my sermon, I did a little something to my, my ribs. So I guess what, what, what God was saying to me is you, you needed to listen to Jeremy's sermon last week because he talked about joy in the midst of suffering. And so to remind me of that, I wore this yellow shirt because that's like joyful and bright and, you know, colorful. And we're talking about this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Did you love that? Man, that was so fun today. Um, great worship, you guys. If, if you noticed, the band was youth today, so it was our youth band that, that uh, led worship. Whoa, I just knocked the thing off. Led worship today, and choir, thank you um, just again for setting that tone of, of worship today. Uh, who's looking forward to tomorrow night? I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. I'm going to be out here. Although my costume originally was going to be one that was going to be like joyful and just a, a great, you know, costume. And I was so looking forward to that, being an excited Dodger fan. And so now I'm going to be a sad Dodger fan. But again, joy in the midst of suffering, right? I guess that's a go Phillies. But no, I'm just, I didn't say that. No. Anyways, um, God, God is good and has a way of just working things out. Um, just, just so crazy. So this past week, not only did Jeremy preach on the issue of joy in the midst of suffering, um, but uh, we taught it in our life groups. But I had a, a privilege of going to a pastor's kind of appreciation uh, breakfast on Wednesday. And the topic there for us pastors was joy in the midst of suffering. And I was like, okay, God, what are you trying to say to me? Um, and so I've, I've been really working on that. Like, how can I have joy in the midst of, of suffering. So that's just a reminder of that. Now, six weeks ago, we began this crazy ride of a series called Gospel-Shaped Living with the reminder that the church is a light in the darkness, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine and won't let Satan it out, won't hide it under a bushel. No, everybody was doing that one, so that's good, right? And that's, that's the reminder for us that we need all the time, that the church is a light in the darkness. Now, five weeks ago, we looked at what it means for the church to be united, right, as a response to the, the division that exists in the world around us, and sometimes even within the church, which is kind of sad, right? Now, four weeks ago, Raj preached and reminded us of what it means for the church to be a serving church, i.e. getting down on our hands and knees and washing people's feet in the midst of a very selfish um, world. And then two weeks ago, we looked at what it means to be a generous church in a stingy world of Scrooge McDucks. Um, yeah, and then last week, Jeremy reminded us of that inevitable suffering that exists in the world, but how our joyful response to that reveals much about our walk with Christ. And so this week, we're going to wrap this series up with what I think, I really think it's been a great series. Um, and we'll see more implications of that as we move forward as well throughout the next month or so. But this week, we're going to wrap it up with some practical steps on how we can be the church in the world. Um, and so obviously, we need God's help to build his kingdom here. Let's pray, you guys. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, just the ability to be able to gather together, that we are your church. And as that song we sang said, the hope, the hope on earth, we know that hope is found in you, Christ, but you've placed us here to extend that hope, to be that shining light to the nations, to the peoples of the earth. Um, and so, Lord, we ask that you would help us in that as we study your word. Again, a, a very familiar passage today about what it means to be salt and light. Lord, we need your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, so this is a familiar passage today. So will you open with me, please, to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. Um, originally, it was only going to be 14 through 16. I was like, you know what? I want to talk about salt, too, because I like salt. Does anybody like salt? Yeah, probably too much. But anyways, um, we're going to talk about what it means to be salt and light from Matthew chapter 5. 
Um, but again, to, it's such a familiar passage, it would be easy to kind of, oh, okay, check out what are those football scores today, you know, what's going on later, I've got like a nominating committee meeting with a bunch of people, I've got to do this and do that, harvest is tomorrow, I've got to do this for my trunk and that for this, okay, but anyway, so let's focus in, you know, for these next few moments and really um, maybe look at it with fresh eyes. To place this in context, just with any other passage of Scripture is crucial for us. Jesus is on a mountain. He is giving what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. He has just laid out in a series of blesseds or beatitudes the nature of life in the kingdom of God. And after this, then we come to these two famous metaphors that point out the sort of impact that you and I, as the church, are supposed to have on the world around us. So let's look at Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. So if you're there, cool. Uh, Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Okay, so we are going to talk about salt uh, first. Any, anybody like salt? Oh, man, I, I don't think we can live without it. But anyways, before the advent of uh, refrigeration, salt was used to preserve meat, to keep meat from rotting, basically. Today, it, it does that a little bit. It serves as a preservative, but it's, nowadays, it's more known as a seasoning, right? We use it to season our food, make things taste uh, good. Um, anybody use cast iron still in your homes? How do you, you know, treat that? You use oil, but then you clean it with salt, right? You use salt to, it, so salt can be like a, an astringent. Ladies, does anybody use like salt scrubs as exfoliating? You're like, what is that? Like two of you, sweet. Okay. Um, but anyways, so we, we, it's an astringent and it, and it ex exfoliates so that you can have this shine, you know, on your skin. But anyways, um, the point is, it's like, what's the point, Jay? The point is that salt does something to whatever it comes in contact with, right? It either preserves or it seasons or it cleanses. Um, I'm sure there's other uses as well. I think it even you know, helps the roads from being slick if you put salt on the, on the roads, right? So it does something to whatever it comes in contact with. Um, what would life be like without salt? Well, maybe a little less high blood pressure, but also some very bland um, food. <laughs> but anyways, as salty believers, you and I ought not to be bland, right? We ought to be seasoning. We ought to affect the world around us. Something comes from our interaction with the world around us. We ought to write the best books. We ought to be the most courteous to people. We ought to be the hardest workers in our jobs. We ought to be the best musicians and artists and craftsmen and students for our students, right? There should be a difference in us, right? We are called to be salty, right? Um, what does Jesus' statement then mean? You are the salt of the earth. And what does it tell us about the culture around us, society, the world, and our role in it. Well, if we are called to be salty, that means our world needs what? Salt. Our world needs to be salted. It needs to be seasoned. That much is clear. Paul tells the Colossian church in Colossians 4, 5 through 6, he says this, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time, let your speech always be gracious, ready, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person, right? Now, perhaps we agree with RVG Tasker, who says that the church, 
by this he means the people, not necessarily the institution, is called to be a moral disinfectant. In a world where moral standards are low, constantly changing, or non-existent. Okay, think of it like that salt scrub, if you will. We are called to rub against the immorality in the culture, causing it to flake away and circle the drain. All right? Now, some may disagree with this, actually, that our job is not to be the moral police. We are to allow the Holy Spirit to be the, the moral police in, in the world. And the church has actually gotten herself into trouble during tri- times of extreme moral policing, such as the Crusades or the Inquisition or the Salem witch trials, to name a few. And so, but the, the reality is it's probably somewhere in between, right? Um, I like Kent, R. Kent Hughes' perspective. He says this. He says, the church as salt functions as a retardant to decay and a preservative in a disintegrating world, okay? He says, as pungent people, isn't that a fun, are we pungent, right? Now, hopefully that's not because we forgot our deodorant this morning, (coughs) junior hires, Um, but anyways, uh, high schoolers do, okay, anyways, um, (laughs) empowered by the presence of Christ's spirit, within us, as pungent people, we are to penetrate society. We are to become involved in life, in the community, in our schools, in politics, and in the world at large. Because we can't be salt unless we have something to salt. Do you you get that? We understand that, right? Okay. Um, The good news is that a little bit goes a long way. Have you ever eaten something that has too much salt in it? Woo, man, you can't even, it's like, you pucker her up and stuff. So a little bit of salt goes a long way. Um, an example of that, I was, I was thinking about this. Um, anybody know the William Wilberforce? You've heard that name before. Okay, so William Wilberforce was a famous abolitionist in England. Um, and, and by the way, this guy, people think of him as like this monster of a man because he did so much change and enacted so much social change. He was a tiny little dude. Um, some would even say he was misshapen. He had been actually dwarfed by disease. And yet, as one commentator, Boswell, writes of him, after listening to one of his speeches, he said this, I saw a shrimp mount the table, but as I listened, he grew and grew until the shrimp became a whale. See, God took that little bit of salt in him and and used it to change the world, okay? He He was salt. And then, then the, the, the question, the verse goes on to say that, that you know, salt loses its salt. If the salt lost its taste, how can, it, how can it be restored? Now, the question is, can salt ever not be salt anymore? Technically, no. Salt is salt. N-A-C-L, right? It is, it's a, unless you like, do some chemical reaction to it. Um, and I'm not a chemist, although I did dabble in chemical engineering for a year in college. But I do know that, that salt is quite stable. And so does Christ's metaphor fall apart here? Well, no. Um, David Turk uh, has suggested what was then popularly called salt was, in fact, a white powder, perhaps from around the Dead Sea. You ever know the Dead Sea, you know, kind of known as the Salt Sea, when the, when the waters evaporate, there's, there's like silt and stuff that's left? Um, so possibly this was that, which makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, while containing sodium chloride also contain much else, since in those days there were no refineries, so they can tell, you know, what is, is this really refined salt or not? But of this dust, the sodium chloride was probably the most soluble component and the most easily washed out. But then what was left was this kind of residue of white powder that looked like salt and might have still been called salt, but neither tasted nor acted like salt. In fact, it was just dust on the road. And so, I thought about that. I said, well, yeah, that's kind of a, a, a cool analogy of what we can be, okay? Um, that, that what might cause us to lose our saltiness, to become just road dust, if you will? And I thought, well, maybe it's because we're not actually in a relationship with Jesus, right? We're not spending time with him every day, right? If my wife and I want to have a good relationship, what do we need to do? We need to talk. <laughs> we need to spend time together. We need to communicate. We need to be with one another. And there are times I know when my schedule gets so busy and I'm like, uh-oh, I'm in for it today, <laughs> right? And I need to you know, reconnect with, 
with my, my wife. And the same thing is true of our relationship with God. If we're not spending time with Him, if we're not in His Word, if we're not in prayer, if we're not being with His people in church, then our salt begins to kind of lose its saltiness or its effectiveness, if you will. Um, or how about when we see the evil things that happen around us and fail to do anything to address those, those issues, right? Uh, A.W. Argyle the inventor of cool socks and sweaters, I'm just kidding, said, yeah, that was for you, Raj. Oh, he's not here. He's in the preschool. But anyways, um, A.W. Argyle said, like salt, a disciple of Jesus is of use only so long as he retains his distinctive quality of discipleship. If he loses his zeal and devotion, he is like salt that has become insipid and therefore useless, incapable of keeping that which it touches pure and pleasant. Jesus has much to say about this to the churches in Revelation as well. If you look at the church at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, uh, he has this to say to this church. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. In other words, you're not refreshing like cold, refreshing water on a hot day, or you're not healing like a mineral like, you know, spring, right? So you're not, you're not refreshing at all. You're not healing at all. You're neither of these things. So because you are lukewarm, meaning useful for absolutely nothing, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, of course, we know he means something a little more extra than spit right? That's what he's talking about. Um, Hughes said this. He said, the reality is, if we are not heating the world, the world is freezing us. If we are not salting the world, the world is making us rot. Okay? Let's not lose our salt. We want to be salty followers of Christ who make a difference in the world around us. Amen? Amen. Okay. So let's turn then to light now. Let's look at light. Now, I know that we've talked about this before. In fact, this was the theme of that first week of our series just six weeks ago, but let this serve as a reminder or a reinforcer of those truths that we learned. First thing, what does light do? What does light do? It illumines the surroundings the house, the street, etc. It expels the darkness. It makes it so that we can see what is around us. It brings clarity to the objects in the room. Anybody ever tried to walk through a dark house that you didn't know before? Like you were at a, a, a friend's house or a relative's house and you're trying to walk and it's like dark and you're trying to find the bathroom. And you're like, Stellar, where is this? You know, we need light, right? We need light. It, it brings clarity, provides direction. And in this case, it says the church is to be the light of what? The world. The church is to be the light of the world. Think about how bright that light has to be to, to light up the entire world. Now, for the church, being light brings goodness, truth, and beauty to bear in the world. The principal function of a household lamp, right, and thus of you and I as believers is to provide illumination to all around. Light reveals things as they really are. And the reality is that the world is in darkness and light has come though. As John says in John 3, 19 through 20, it says this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. Now, did you catch how scathing that remark is? What does the world love? Darkness. The world loves darkness, okay? Shakespeare explores this through his character of Lady Macbeth. Anybody ever read Macbeth before in school? Okay. Lady Macbeth, she's plotting to murder King Duncan. She says this. She says, come thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keep knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark. 
right? What is she saying in, in essence? Darkness, surround me so that I don't have to feel and see what I'm actually doing. How many of us make that excuse? Like, I just want to do things in the dark because to bring it to light is painful. It hurts. It means I know I'm doing something wrong, right? And so you know, the, 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 the darkness the darkness surrounds us, but we're called to be light. The world is indeed in the darkness. And let's face it, what is darkness? It's sin. It's sin. The world has a sin problem, and, and we are called to bring light into that. Now, that means we also have to let the light shine in us. And so if you and I have a sin problem, we need to look to Jesus and the cross and say, okay, Lord, I got a problem. I need saving. I need your light to shine through me, Okay. And so make sure we do that as well. And let's not forget that to be a light then in the world, we actually have to be in the world. Yes, light. (laughs) But we also have to be in the world, right? We are called to be in the world, not of it, but we have to be in the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We can't hide our lights under a bushel. No, we must put it on a stand, the passage says. You see, there is no such thing as an invisible believer. There is no such thing as an invisible believer. We are all visible in some way. We are all shining whatever kind of light it is out in this community. So if we're at the grocery store and we decide that we're going to be that grumbling person that's at the grocery store because we're just mad at everybody and everything that day, but people around us know that we're believers, what is that going to say about our light that we're shining? Not so good, okay? Um, There's no such thing as an invisible believer. Um, I have a good friend, Steve Robbins, who runs a a ministry for pastors that I'm a part of. And he said this. He said, the world, for better or worse, forms its view of Christianity from the visible church. See, people will will form their view of, of who Christ is, of what he teaches from you and I and how we act out in out in the world. Okay? Another commentator said, Jesus' disciples have the kingdom life within them as a living testimony to those in the world who do not yet have the light. And so why might we then be tempted, though, to hide our lights? Because we're told not to. So is that a temptation for us to hide our lights, hide it under a bushel? No, right? Well, maybe it's fear. Maybe we're afraid of what people are going to say about us. Oh, they're going to they're going to persecute me. They're going to say I'm, I'm a dumb fairy tale follower. They're going to you know, make me feel bad about myself, but you know, I'm, I'm afraid of that, right? Or maybe, uh, you know, God forbid we would, we would be you know, shameful. Like, it's not a shameful thing to follow Christ, right? Anybody ashamed of Jesus? What does he say about being ashamed of him? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Right? Don't be ashamed of the gospel, right? Is the power of God for our salvation. So we shouldn't feel ashamed. We shouldn't feel fear. Perhaps it's because we just think we don't know enough. We might be ignorant, right? Well, Jesus said, hey, suffer the little children to come unto me. And those little children can serve as an example. I don't know everything, you guys. Anyone who claims to know everything about Christ and his word, they're liars. (laughs) There's always more to learn and to grow. And so if there's somebody who comes to us and we don't know the answer to that question, it's okay to say, you know what? I don't know. Let me do some study. Let me look that up. Let me think about that for a while and get back to you. Mind blown. Instead of fumbling and trying to figure things out that we just don't know, right? Um, Sometimes it might be uh, ignorance, like I said, or perhaps, and here's the scary one, Perhaps we just don't have any light in the first place. Perhaps we are like those people who on that last day where we stand before Jesus, he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Well, when did I not cast out demons in your name? God, when did I do all these things for you? And he has to depart from me. I never knew you. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, if we find ourselves in a tendency to put the light under a bushel, We must begin to examine ourselves and make sure that it really is light that we're hiding. That's not something we like to think about, right? 
Now, for those of us who have professed belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we can rest assured in that salvation that the Holy Spirit acts as the seal of our salvation, okay? The evidence of that is the fruit that is born in our lives. And so if the fruit's not coming, we should maybe think, okay, God, where am I with you right now? Where am I with you? All right. So what is the result then of this light that we come to bear? The result, according to Jesus here, of people seeing our light, specifically as verse 16 said, seeing our good deeds. What does it say? They will give glory to God. They will give glory to God. Now, has anyone ever wondered what Jesus meant by good deeds? What, what does he mean by good deeds here? Um, it, it seems that good deeds is a, is a kind of a general term for anything or everything that a Christian would say and do because, well, we're Christians, right? Perhaps that's the case. The Westminster Confession of Faith defines good works as the actions that God has commanded us to do in His holy word that are fruit and evidence of a true and lively faith. Now, John Stott takes it a step farther. He says, good deeds are every outward and visible manifestation of our faith. They express not only our loyalty to God, but also our care for others. Indeed, the primary meaning of deeds must be practical, visible acts of compassion. Because it's when people see these, Jesus said, that they will glorify God. For they embody the good news of his love, which we proclaim. And without them, our gospel loses its credibility and our God loses his honor. So not only without them will the gospel lose its credibility and God not be honored, but also sometimes with them if we do them, though, for the wrong reasons, for the wrong motives. Matthew 6.1 tells us to beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. You see, the difference between those two passages is those two words, in order. We do it so that Christ may be seen, so that God may be glorified, not so that we may be seen and get the glory. Daniel Doriani said, At best, our light will lead to praise of the Father as people turn from our little lights to the source of all. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.9 and following, he says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. See, friends, you and I have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And those who've been called out of darkness into that light, let's make sure that we are truly reflections of the light of the sun so that he may receive the glory. You see, I've often heard it said that Christians are the moon. You understand that analogy, that we are the moon? What does the moon do? Does the moon shine light of itself? No, it reflects the light of the sun, okay? And that's what we're called to do, reflect his light so that he may receive glory. So then, friends, how then? How are we to be the church in the world? And I'm gonna get really practical here for a second, okay? First, and this might sound like a duh moment, like duh, (laughs) but I'll say this, it's get involved at TFB. Get involved at TFB. By the way, for those of you who are visiting us, Torrance First Baptist, TFB, <laughs> right? That is who we, that is who we are. Um, I want you to do something right now for me. Inside your bulletins, if you got one, there's a little card. 
And on that little card, it's a commitment card. Um, and, and we have some extras in the back. So if you didn't get one, I know there's some little extra ones in the back. You can grab it now. Maybe Debbie will go grab them and, and pass some out over here. Um, so if anybody doesn't have one, you can raise your hand and Debbie will come by and, and give that. If we don't have enough for everyone, you can like double up with your you know, spouse or friend which is fine. So the reason we're doing this is that we, we realize that not everyone knows what kind of the next steps are. So raise your hand if you didn't get one. Debbie's going to come around with those. Um, is that not everyone understands kind of the process of, of how to you know, really dig into life here at TFB? So we want to let you in on a little bit of that. And we also want to see where you guys are. Because maybe you're just at level one. You're just at level one. That's where you might find yourself today. Hey, I'm just visiting and if that's it, and you're just visiting with us today, just do me a favor and check off that little you know, mark there. I'm just visiting today. Or if you've been coming for quite some time now, and you're like, man, I want to know. I want to know what's the next steps for me here at, at TFB. Um, then, then mark that, that second one, if you will. Um, and then on. So you'll see level two then is, is what? It's to join a life group. Because we really do want everyone to be part of a life group. Now, we have life groups that meet on Sunday mornings. We have life groups that meet all throughout the week. We've got one on Monday, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, two on Thursday. We got uh, one on Friday. We got lots of groups in order to choose from. Some people are in like two or three or four different groups. Um, but life groups are where we learn, or where we, sorry, where we love, learn, and live out this Christian uh, walk together. So if you are interested in that, if you're already faithfully attending one, hey, just mark that box. I attend a life group. Or let us know. Maybe I, I want some more information. Let us know. Okay? The next card then, the next one then is to become a member of TFB. You've, you've kind of sunk your teeth in. You, you understand what life is like at TFB. You've been coming to church services. You, you've been, uh, you know, joining in for activities that are outside of church, and, and you've been part of a life group. Maybe you're like, okay, now I really want to, this is my church. This is my home. I want to I invest myself here. Well, let's talk about what it means to become a member. I don't have time to fully get into that now, but we have membership packets in the back, or you could join us over in the, uh, in the Welcome Center after church today. Um, and then after that is to uh, be, begin to serve. Like, where can I serve? How can I help out? Can I serve within the children's or the youth ministries? Can I serve in the choir or in the, or in the praise team? Can I, can I serve, you know, just taking care of our facilities or being part of our hospitality or fellowship crew? You know, all kinds of different aspects to serve. And if you want information on any one of those, write it in there. I want information on this, on how I can be involved here at TFB. And then the next step would be, okay, now I want to be a, I, I feel like God is calling me to be a leader. Now, whoever says, I feel like I'm called to be a leader, and, you know, that sometimes we might think that that's not being humble and we want to be humble. You obviously have to admit that you want to be a leader too, Okay. Um, so go ahead and, and, and mark that there if you, if you have an interest ever in serving on our board or being a ministry team leader. Um, obviously, the pastors will look at these things and, and have conversations with you as well. So take a moment to just kind of fill that out. If you can, after we leave today, if you can drop that in one of the offering boxes. There's three of them in the back today. We would really, really appreciate that. And then we will follow up on that. We'll get back to you um, if you have any questions. If you have any other questions, let us know. But then look at the very last thing on that card. What does the last thing say? And this is for all levels, whether you're visiting, whether you're a member, whether you're involved in leadership, whatever it is, the last thing on there says what? We need to be about our mission, which is love God, love people, teach others to do the same, okay? It's not even up there. You guys know it. Awesome. Anybody cheat and look at the back? Sweet. Sweet. Um, so if you have questions, again, please don't hesitate to ask. If you're new, like I said, we'd love for you to join the pastors briefly in the Welcome Center, which is right in the, the courtyard over that way, um, briefly after the service. And guess what? We'll even give you a cup of coffee and let you keep the cup. Oh, yeah. All right. We all done? Cool. As you finish those up, I, I want to point out two more things. Two more things. Points of application. How are we to be the church in the world? Well, and these two things kind of have to go together. The first thing is we need to be different than the world. We cannot be so much like the world 
that there's nothing that sets us apart from the world. In fact, the church is called the gathered people of God, the ones who are set apart, right, as holy for him. That, that word literally means set apart. Um, we, we, we have to be different than the world. Martin Lloyd-Jones says the glory of the gospel is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts it. It is then that the world is made to listen to her message, though it may hate it at first. Because if there's nothing different, if we can't offer anything different from what the world offers, we might as well just be Kiwanis Club or something like that. Right? There has to be something that sets us apart from the world. In fact, this whole series has been a, a, a setup of contrasts. We've been called to be a united church in a divided world. You see, the world is divided along so many lines. Politics, race, socioeconomics, worldview. And sadly, the church is often just as, if not more so, divided than the world. And this shouldn't be. And we divide over petty things, non-essentials like colors of carpets. Come on. The church is called to be united so that the world may know. We're also called to be a serving church in a selfish world. The world is always looking out for number one. What can I get out of something? What, is it, what good is it for me? And sadly, though, that mantra creeps into our consumeristic church today as well. You see, friends, the church is called to serve, not to be served, because that's what Jesus modeled for us. Number three, a generous church in a stingy world. You see, the world is full of scrooges holding on to what they have with tight fists. That doesn't ever happen in the church, does it? Do we ever hoard our resources? Do we ever hold on so tight to our stuff and we just can't let it go? The church is called to be generous with our time, our talent, and our treasure. Okay. How about the fourth one, which is a truthful church in a confused world? The world is so confused on so many fronts. Religion, politics, economics, entertainment, gender identity, sexuality, issues of life and death, etc., etc., etc. I can go on forever. All right? Confusion then creeps into the church as well when we don't recognize the truth of who God is and the word that he has given us. See, the church is to be a people that stands on the truth but does so by speaking it in love. Okay? Because there's a lot of confusion. And then finally, from last week, again, we learned the joyful church in a suffering world. The world around us is suffering. Really, we all will at some point, are or will the world tries to alleviate it, deny it, blame God for it. Sadly, the church doesn't always respond to suffering in the way we ought either. Now, the church is called to be a people who understands that suffering is real, but whose focus is so much on Jesus that we can't help but exude his joy. And so we need to be different from the world. Right? We are the called out ones. If there's areas of your life where you look just like the world or you think just like the world, ask God to reveal those. Where is it that I'm loving the world? Where is it that I'm acting like the world? Okay. But then secondly, we are called to be salt and light in the world. Be salt and light in the world. Douglas Sean O'Donnell said this, when Christians love others, even their enemies, the world tastes the salt and sees the light of the gospel. When we pray for and respect those in authority, the world tastes the salt and sees the light of the gospel. When we give generously to those in need, the world tastes the salt and sees the light of the gospel. When we control our anger, lust, and lies, the world tastes the salt and sees the light of the gospel. When we trust in God to provide in trying economic times, the world tastes the salt and sees the light of the gospel. When we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, or visit the sick and those in prison, it is though as we become like Moses when he descended from Mount Sinai, our faces and our hands showed this dark world something of the Father's glory, to be salt and light in the world. Oh, church, that that would be us, 
the world around us would be changed. Obviously through Jesus Christ and him alone. But how does he want to use us? It's almost as if this guy went through the same series that we did. You see, that's what gospel-shaped living is all about. It's about doing life as the changed people of God. We are salty because he salted us. Amen? And we are light because we reflect the true light of the world, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh, yes, Lord, you call us to be salt and light in the world. Uh, We know that in order to do so, we need to be involved with other believers who are salty and light right along with us. And so help us to see where we can be involved at TFB and how we can really be part of this community and serve and, and love each other and encourage each other and edify each other so that we can go together out into the world and be that salt and light. Lord, help us to not be so like the world that we actually are no longer salty, but we're no longer shining a light. Lord, teach us what it means to be the church, the called out ones, the gathered community of Christ who is set apart, who is called to be holy. But then, Lord, help us to to rub elbows with those around us so that they may see our good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. To be salt and light. That's what you've called us to be, Lord. We need your strength for that. We need your help with that. We, we, We understand that Through you, mountains can be moved. We pray this believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing our closing song together. At the very beginning of this message series, we sang this to end it off. The song is called Mighty to Save. And the bridge says, shine your light and let the whole world see. Because we're singing for the glory of the risen King, amen? Gospel shaped living. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Everyone needs forgiveness, a kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. And Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, he rose in Singing for the glory of the 
church are we going to shine his light today we're going to go out into this world that is darkness and we're going to bring his goodness truth and beauty to bear are we going to recognize that we are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light Let's go today, shine your light, and let the whole world see. We're singing for whose glory? Jesus' glory, the glory of the risen King, Jesus. God bless you and those watching at home, we love you. Again, if you're visiting with us today, you want to join us for a cup of coffee, get to know the pastors, please do so. Otherwise, we'll hopefully see you either tonight or tomorrow night at harvest. God bless you guys. Have a great day.